Hello everybody and a big welcome welcome from me and Grigri to this week's Easy 11 Plus live lesson. You got a quick flash of me there I think before the countdown music started. I hope that wasn't too dramatic. Um, anyway, it's fantastic to have you here for this lesson on comprehension. Grigri's very read up for it as you can see and it's lovely to have so many people already joining in the live chat. Wonderful to see you all. Um, uh, someone says, bro, someone left it and it already started, lol. Well, I can only say that bro is missing out. Don't forget my fantastic offer, as I'm reminding people frequently at the moment, where you can send me a piece of your work for, let's bring the microphone a bit nearer, for um, completely free marking, if you haven't used my marking service before. Uh, so this is a fantastic opportunity to send me a short piece of descriptive writing or a story or even a few comprehension answers if you want to for my personal feedback and you get your feedback with little voice clips and little videos uh, and all sorts of wonderful things in which I tell you how wonderful you are but also how you can improve. If you want to take advantage of this offer then um, there's a link in the video description. I'll also post one in the general comments afterwards. Uh, but also just Google 11 plus lifeline and you'll find a big link at the top of the page that tells you how to take advantage of this special offer. Right, I've hammered on for long enough now. Um, let's get on to today's questions. So we're looking at this text, which is all about a fox. It's a very short text, which works quite well for a video like this because I can show all of it on the screen. Um, and we've got a set of questions. And if you uh, wish that you'd seen the questions in advance, then I'm gonna tell you how you can do that in the future. So the questions are always linked in the video description under the video. So as soon as, the, um, as soon as I post the link to the video a few days in advance, you can find the question paper there. But also if you're on my mailing list, um, and you get into my mailing list by clicking the free resources link in the video description, uh, then I send out my worksheets a few days in advance usually, usually on a Saturday morning, so you've got the weekend to try the questions out before the lesson so you come fully armed. Okay, that was a lot of talking, definitely time for me to blow my nose, it's a problem with holding cats, you get an itchy nose, and let's get cracking with the questions. Um, so many people coming in in the comments with all sorts of things. Uh, whoever's called X, please don't spam the comments with massive screeds of nonsense. It just makes it harder for other people to follow what's going on. If you're not in the live comments and you'd like to be, you just need to click subscribe under the video. That's a subscribe button, it's completely free, and then you can join in the live chat. Okay, so the author writes that the fox has been so persistently hunted by man that he is almost untamable. Explain what this phrase means. Suggest a reason why this might be the case. And you can see that there are four marks available and it's always good to have a, a sensible quick think about the marks. There are two parts to this question. Neither of them is just a simple yes, no, or anything like that. So it's reasonable to imagine that there might be two marks available for each half of this question, which is important insofar as it reminds you to make sure that your answer is well balanced. You don't want to be in the fifth line of these six lines of answer space and still be on the first part. Um, you want to make sure that you've worked out something of what you're going to say in advance. Right, so um, let's look at this phrase in the text. So uh, where are we looking at here? We're looking at line eight. He has been so persistently hunted by man 
that he is almost untamable. Now, it says he here. Who is he? Let's look back at the question quickly. It says, the fox has been so persistently hunted by man. So you might be under the misapprehension that we're talking about one particular fox here. But if you've read the passage as a whole and thought about it, which you must do before you answer any of the questions, always, however time pressured you feel, then you will notice that in fact in this text the phrase the fox refers to foxes in general. There is a reason for the fox being termed the shrewdest of wild creatures and then we see he used a lot to refer to the fox. This is quite an old-fashioned text um, and we can tell if we read this intelligently that this is not about a particular fox. This is about foxes in general. So don't make the mistake of thinking you're writing about just one fox. So he means foxes, he has, they have been so persistently hunted by man that they are almost untamable. There are two key words here, aren't there? Persistently and untamable. Now this is effectively a rewrite in your own words question. And to do that, you need to clearly understand what the main ideas are in the thing that you need to explain. And then you need to find a way to explain it as though you're explaining it to a friend of yours who's sitting just over there, out of my screen or out of, you know, next to your desk, whatever it might be. So, he's been so persistently hunted by man that he's almost untamable. Well, untamable is probably the easier word, isn't it? Because it contains within it the word tame. What does tame mean? This is a word that I'm sure everybody here knows. So a tame animal, is an animal that um, that will come up easily to humans and will, to one extent or another, do what humans want it to do. It might not come to their name, but it will certainly, you know, understand offerings of food and it'll be obliging and it won't, you know, make constant chaos in your life. The fox is untamable. Ubble is something you stick on the end of a word to talk about something you are able to do, something you can do, and un means not. So untamable must mean that you can't tame it. Being so persistently hunted by man, he's almost untamable. Now, there are no other clues here to tell us what persistently might mean, but it's obviously strengthening hunted. So it might mean something like savagely or seriously or whatever. But you have almost certainly come across the word persistent. Okay, or persistence is another word you might have come across. Think what that means. What does it mean to be persistent? What does it mean to persist at something? And hopefully you recognise that it means to keep doing it. And so I'm trying to illustrate how even if you don't know a word like persistently or untamable, you'll often be able to get there through other words that you do recognise. So the fox has been so relentlessly, so constantly hunted by man that he is all, that it's almost impossible to tame him. But we're still very close to the original. We need to explain it a little bit better than that by showing that we can more clearly put it into our own words. What did I do in my original example? I'm going to cheat shamelessly. Um, yeah, so persistently is talking about it happening a lot. And in this case, it must be over many, many years over, you know, the development of foxes alongside humans. So foxes have been hunted so much, I've been hunted by people so much over the years that now it's almost impossible to make them tame. Now the word tame is still the same word that's there, but it's close enough, but it's, it's different enough. It clearly shows understanding that you'll get away with it. If you want another word, you could use a word like, oh, <coughs> too many cats. You can use a word like um, domesticate, but I wouldn't necessarily, um, assume that you know that, but you could say something like, it's almost impossible to teach them to trust people. <coughs> I beg your pardon, I beg your pardon. Um, can a cat really be called tame if it does this to my nose? Oh, then again, maybe it's just because I've got such a massive nose, it just sucks in every cat related thing within the nearest half a mile. Okay, so we can explain this. But we also have to suggest a reason why this might be the case. Now, suggest is a very important word because it means that you're being invited to make what I must, might almost call an educated guess. This word tells you that the answer is not in the text. You have to use your, um, you have to use your brain. So not why has it been hunted, but why has that made it untamable? Well, why that might be. If you're a fox and people keep hunting you, 
over time, you're going to get the idea that people are bad news and you need to be very careful around them. And you're certainly not going to make the mistake of doing what they say. And so that's basically what it is, isn't it? All we have to do now is explain it. So we're going to write something like this. He shamelessly consults his notes. Um, so this means, always a good opening because it's answering the question. This means, oops, I'm not on the answer sheet, sorry. This means that foxes, so not a particular fox, and apologi apologies to those of you who don't know me for my execrable handwriting as I write on this glass screen, which is my usual excuse, even if it's true. Uh, this means that foxes um, have been hunted so much by humans, sorry about the handwriting, over the years <laughs> that by now it is all <coughs> goodness me, quite a spectacle today. By now, so if I'm blowing your ears off, it's quite a sensitive microphone, sorry. That by now it is almost impossible. impossible as an M, to make them trust people. So, let's just check that we've covered all the main meaning from the quote, which is important. So, it's been persistently, we've dealt with that so much over the years, hunted. Uh, yeah, I've kept that word in because it has a clear meaning. I don't think you need to show understanding of it. Uh, by man, so by humans. Um that he is almost untamable, that by now it is almost impossible to make them trust people. So that's very clearly explained every part of the phrase. We're okay there. Good to see you. Oh, it's like I'm ill, but I'm not. Okay. Suggest a reason why this might be the case. Well, I spoke about this, didn't I? So it looks like I'm crying now. I am crying. I'm just crying from cat. Um, so what was the reason why it might be the case? We said, I said, let's be honest, I'm just lecturing at you, which is very um, unkind of me. Um, people are saying, stop saying we cannot hear Robert, that will break his self-confidence and we can hear you, Robert. My self-confidence um, was broken by you guys a long time ago, so there's no further for it to fall. But thank you very much for the sentiment. Um, and I'm glad that you can, in fact, hear me. I don't know why people think they can't hear me. Okay, maybe you've got your, maybe you've got your sound off. Okay, anyway, what was I doing? I was answering the question. Suggest a reason why this might be the case. Okay, sorry, I'm trying to collect my thoughts after all that sneezing. Uh, and it was simply that if they've learned that people are bad news, they're going to stay away from them. So how might we ex express this? Um, foxes have survived, sorry, awful handwriting, by learning avoid to avoid humans um, um, and this is now a powerful instinct okay I reckon that's clear enough for the reason for the second part. So we very clearly got our four marks, and in fact, we've done it with a whole unused line to spare underneath. Let's read the whole answer. This means that foxes have been hunted so much by humans over the years that by now it is almost impossible to make them trust people. Foxes have survived by learning to avoid humans, and this is now a powerful instinct. Okay? Really clear. Let's check back through the question. Um, have we explained what the phrase means fully and clearly without just repeating chunks of it. Yes, we have. We've already been through that. Have we suggested a reason, so not something from the text, but suggested based on our own good sense, why this might be the case? Um, they survived by learning to avoid humans and this is now a powerful instinct. Yes, we have. It's a perfectly sensible reason that cannot but get the marks unless something has gone horrifically wrong, as long as the marker can read my handwriting. Okay, on to the next. You may notice we went from question five to question seven. It's a paper from 11 plus Lifeline. It had lots of questions. I've just picked out a small number of them for this lesson so that it doesn't go on for hours. Oh. 
Good, I think my sneezing is, fingers crossed, getting a little bit better. Read the following interpretation of lines 13 to 14. There are nearly as many foxes as there are woods. Sounds like something from a maths test, doesn't it? Is this an accurate understanding of these lines? Explain your answer. Okay. Maybe not so much maths, maybe more reasoning. Okay. Um, someone says, please stop talking about Ronaldo. I apologise, I will try to talk less about Ronaldo. Um, right, lines 13 to 14. Let's have a look. So we are down in this part here. Foxes are much more plentiful than generally supposed. Good to know, unless you like chickens. It is almost safe to say that wherever there are woods, there are foxes. Yet so wonderfully clever that they are, that are they, that few are seen. Okay. So foxes are plentiful, there are lots of them. It is almost safe to say that wherever there are woods, there are foxes. So before we get stuck into the question, let's just think about what this means in its own right. Wherever there are woods, there are foxes. Almost, you can almost say that. So over there, there is a wood. In fact, yes, over there, there literally is a wood, although you can't see it. Anyway, um, <clears throat> and according to this text, it's really likely that there are foxes in that wood. This is saying that almost any wood you point to will contain foxes. The question says, there are nearly as many foxes as there are woods. Nearly as many foxes as there are woods. Well, it does say it's almost safe to say it. So maybe according to this text, there are some woods in which there aren't any foxes. So the nearly makes sense. Nearly as many foxes as there are woods. But what would this mean? It would mean that in that wood, there's a fox. In that wood, there's a fox. In that wood, there's a fox. But in that wood, there isn't a fox. <coughs> so I pointed to four woods, but only three of them have a fox in. That's what this would mean. Makes sense, doesn't it? Or what's the problem? Well, let us think about this for a second, a second more. That only makes sense if there's only one fox in each wood that has foxes. Exactly, well done Mothership in the comments. You got on there just a millisecond after me, but I suspect that's just the lag in the comment timing. Mothership says, no, because there could be multiple foxes in one wood. Exactly. Exactly. And in fact, that shows such good understanding. I'm just going to check what I put for the mark scheme. Um, yeah, I think that would be completely clear. In fact, Mothership, your answer is so good that I'm just going to copy it down entire because it's just as good as what I've got written. I've got something much more long-winded here, um, <clears throat> but I think that's absolutely fine. Um, <clears throat> I'm just going to... If I'm saying no, I'm going to be slightly more formal. Um, it is not accurate. Because there, I'm using exactly your words, there could be because there could be multiple foxes in one wood. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and that's what you put. I would give that three marks, but a little bit of exam technique. You've been given six lines here. There are three marks available. It's wise to add a little bit more explanation just so the examiner doesn't think that you're taking them for granted. Make sure of the marks. Um, um, so I'm going to clarify a bit. This means... that... there are actually... likely... You can't read my writing, but I'm saying what I'm writing out loud. That there are actually likely to be more foxes than woods. I mean, I say likely, it's an absolute certainty, but, you know, I'm just sticking to the terms of the question. It is not accurate, so I've answered whether it is, and uh, so that's probably going to get me one mark, because there could be multiple foxes in one wood probably already getting the next two marks, but I'm going to make clear. This means that there are actually likely to be more foxes than woods. And now there is no way that any examiner who doesn't have it in for me 
in a truly egregious fashion is going to give me anything but three marks. Okay, onwards. Reno says, I can read Robert's handwriting. That's absolutely incredible. It's so incredible that I almost don't believe you. I think you're just flattering me. But I can take flattery. I like flattery. Keep flattering me. Flattery in the comments is always very welcome, especially from you lot. Okay, we are halfway there. Um, there are only four questions we're looking at today, although question nine has got two parts. Question eight, let's hide question nine so you're not distracted, because I know you're very easily distracted because you have roving and intelligent minds. Because you have roving and intelligent minds, yes, publicity spot, let's take a publicity spot, there we are. Because you have roving and intelligent minds, don't miss out on my free marking offer where you can send a piece of work for voice and video feedback telling you how you're wonderful and how you could get better. Check out the 11 Plus Lifeline page to learn more. Thank you for listening to my promotional spot. Right, back to question eight. Why are knowledgeable people reluctant to admit that they have spotted signs of a nearby fox? Okay. <coughs> I don't know. That would seem like very strange behavior. Um, surely if you've seen a fox, you want to tell people about it. So let's have a look at the text. But before we do, let me talk about that stupid thing that I just did, in which I was just being silly and said, I don't know, why would they do this? Why would someone who likes foxes not want to talk about it? That actually, although I'm just being silly and talking for the sake of, you know, filling the silence, it's actually a really good thought process. If you start by considering why this thing might be puzzling, you'll be in a really good mindset to engage with the text and understand the reasons why. Let's do that. So first of all, we need to... Um, find where this information is. So you flick through the passage again, but of course, because you have read the passage before looking at the questions, which you must always do, you know where to find this information in the passage. And that's one of the key reasons to read in advance. And for example, if the information is actually spread between more than one spot in the text, you know which spots to look at. But here it isn't, it's all down the bottom. We're looking at line 15 onwards. Let's read those lines. Whoever can distinguish their tracks, fox's tracks, from those of other animals, is usually not disposed to tell of the discovery of fox sign. Okay, that's written in quite a complex way, but not disposed to tell of the discovery probably has enough words familiar to you within it that you can work out that this is the right bit. <clears throat> and then it's reasonable to suppose that the next question, next sentence is going to contain the reasons why. Let's see. The friend of the fox fears the fox's enemy. What does that mean? So a person who likes foxes and wants foxes to stay alive in as great a number as possible, fears the fox's enemy. Who's the fox's enemy? Well, there are various possibilities, but we've already read that foxes are have been hunted by people so much over the years that now they're very nervous about people. So the enemy of the fox is surely the hunter in this context. So people who love foxes fear the enemy of the fox. Why does that mean they are not disposed to tell of the discovery of fox sign? In other words, not willing to say where foxes have been? Well, because it might tip off hunters to go and hunt the foxes there. Okay, so that's one part. People who like foxes don't want to say where they are in case hunters catch on and hunt them. The trapper fears a competitor. What's a competitor? Well, it contains, almost contains the word compete, doesn't it? Someone who competes. Who competes with a trapper? Another trapper, another hunter, someone else who wants to catch foxes. In other words, if you like hunting foxes and you found a really good place to do it, you don't want to tip other people off so that they can go and hoover up the foxes. So we've got two groups here. We've got fox lovers who don't want to tip off hunters and hunters who don't want to tip off other hunters. Basically, it's a great conspiracy against hunters. Um, it's a hard life. So they're the two sides that we need to explain. Let's look, at, look back at the question a little bit more. Why are knowledgeable people, so people who know about foxes, these two groups, you know, um, fox lovers and hunters, reluctant to admit that they have spotted signs of a nearby fox? Why are they reluctant to admit this, people? Um, um, there's a rather complex answer from Finn's football chat, which I think is a little over complex um, for one half of the question, although nonetheless not 
not entirely incorrect. Um, we've got two categories of knowledgeable people. And I think we're going to do best if we deal with them separately and clearly get our two marks for each one. So, um, what was the first part? The friend of the fox fears the fox's enemy. So, um, fox lovers do not want to betray a fox's location to hunters, and let's explain a tiny bit more because this was quick, to hunters who might kill it. Okay, simple and direct. Fox lovers do not want to betray a fox's location to hunters who might kill it. By the way, quick um, quick note on the English. You know, so I've written foxes. Um, a common mistake would be to write foxes. But that would be the plural of fox, not the possessive. And this is possessive, the fox's location, the location of the fox. So this spelling up here would be wrong. Okay, fox lovers do not want to betray a fox's location to hunters who might kill it. Okay. Um, hunters or trappers there's no particular reason why I need to quote here because I'm it, I'm not required to provide evidence, but um, it does no harm to show that I'm looking closely at the text. Hunters or trappers do not want other hunters to to get there first. Again, that's probably enough, but I'm just going to make sure of the marks because I haven't written very much. Do not want other hunters to get there first and kill the fox before they do. My handwriting is degenerating um, and I bet that even whoever it was probably can't read it anymore. Someone was asking a while ago why the stream is lagging. It's always possible that that's from my end, but the more likely explanation is that you've got the, your quality on the video turned up too high. If you're watching this on YouTube, there's a little, um, a little cog symbol at the bottom of the video screen. If you click on that, there's an option to change the quality. And basically, if you change the quality up, the things on your screen will be clearer, which is good for attempting to decipher my handwriting. But if the video is lagging, if you turn the quality down, then... Um, uh, then the streaming is easier for your network and your computer to handle. And if you're having lagging problems, that might help. So quick bit of technical advice there. Okay, so um, knowledgeable people, we've identified the two groups. Fox lovers do not want to portray a fox's location to hunters who might kill it. Hunters or trappers do not want other hunters to get there first and kill the fox before they do. Simple. Clearly explained. This isn't a question that requires lots of evidence. Uh, you just need to explain it properly. And that, I hope, I have done. Um, I realise all these screeds with colons in my, in my comments coming from my streaming software. It's just occurred to me now, which has taken me a very long time, but I'm old and slow, that of course, this is the way that emojis get transcribed by my streaming software. So for example, when 2022 Mindset writes, Robert the goat colon glasses, purple, yellow diamond, colon goat turquoise, white horns, um, it occurs to me what that actually means is they've written Robert the goat, which I'm sure is supposed to be a compliment. Um, and then there is an emoji of something with glasses and then there's another emoji of a goat with turquoise and white horns. I bet that's what it is. I bet. Um, I know what goat means really and I'm very flattered. Uh, shout out to the cats, Fluffy and Oreo um, from Sanket. Um, someone disrespected me apparently. Outrageous. Um, I've been goated and I can see actual goats on my screen so these emojis are working. Uh, it seems that my software is picking up on some but not others. Um, Okay, uh, Chloe can still read my handwriting. Chloe is a handwriting wizard. 
Okay, write down two examples of alliteration from the last sentence of the passage, and you will be relieved to know that 9b on your screen is the very last part of the questions we're looking at today. So hopefully we won't go on too long. It'll be a nice, reasonably short lesson. Okay, write down two examples of alliteration from the last sentence of the passage. And my wife is trying to call me because she has forgotten that I'm doing this lesson. Outrageous. Um, okay, two examples of alliteration from the last sentence of the passage. So let's look at that sentence. I can see it, but you can't. Now you can. So the friend of the fox fears the fox's enemy. Can you see any alliteration in there? I'm not sure. I don't know. There might be one or two F sounds. Yeah, of course. You know what alliteration is. If you don't, you're about to have a reminder. Um, alliteration is very close repetition of consonant sounds. No, that not vowels. Consonant sounds at the beginning of words. Friend fox fears foxes. The friend of the fox fears the fox's enemy. Let's go for a different colour here just to keep life interesting. So we've got the friend of the fox fears the fox's enemy. Okay. Sorry, that was a disgusting noise. Involuntary. It's just all that clogging up from cats. Excuse me a second. <laughs> oh, I'm cat stricken. I have cat fever. Oh dear, sorry. Right. Um, the friend of the fox. Oh, I'm sounding like this. The friend of the fox fears the fox's enemy. What's the effect of this? Well, when you're talking about alliteration, this isn't important. That I've spoken about this before, but um, it should be a useful reminder, I hope. When you're talking about alliteration, if you want to give a really good answer, you should think about two different things. You should think about the um, the literal implication of the alliteration, if there is one. So what idea does it emphasize? And you should think about the metaphorical effect of the sound. What does it sound like? Okay. Friend of the fox fears the fox's enemy. It's kind of whispered like something secret. This is like the friends of the fox treading quietly or speaking quietly because they don't want hunters to find out about the fox. Um, okay. By the way, I know there are two parts to this question, but I'm thinking about it all as one. Um, we'll come to the part B in a second, but I just want to think about the alliteration while it's on the screen. Does that alliteration, I'm checking my notes to make sure I didn't come up with anything incredibly clever that I haven't thought of now. Um, um, so, yeah. So, it sounds like someone treading carefully or whispering. Um, that's what it kind of literally sounds like. And it emphasises the secrecy of people who know where foxes are. Okay? Nice. Two sides. The more literal and the more metaphorical. What else have we got? The trapper fears a competitor. And so the wily creature weaves his trail endlessly about the countryside, unwatched except by the very few who know. Well, there's only one other possibility here, isn't there? Let's go for a different colour. Why? Let's go for blue. Let's go for blue. Save the best till last. The wily creature weaves his tail endlessly about the countryside. The wily creature weaves. Okay? So, what is going on there? Does it really sound like anything? Wah, 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 wah. To be honest, I can't think of anything that's actually going on here that that sounds like. But the rhythm... Aha! Got it. Okay. So. The friend of the fox fears the fox's enemy. Okay. Um, now, very important point. When you see write down, it also applies to things like list and so on, in a question, that means you do not need to write full sentences, you do not introduce, you absolutely do not need to say, my first example is... No, just write it down. You can put quotation marks on if you want, because it is a quotation after all. Example two was, wily creature... weaves. Now, 
Another very important point coming. I'm full of them today. If you look at the text, it says, And so the wildly creature weaves his tail endlessly about the countryside. Countryside, strangely, seems to be two words. Um, it's an, quite an old text. Also, I think, American, as you can guess from the fact it refers to the opossum, which is not a British animal. Um, the wily creature weaves his trail endlessly about the countryside. If you copy down all of that, you will lose um, the mark, almost certainly. Because this is only referring to the last sentence. And if you copy down a whole chunk of that sentence, then you might just be guessing. You have to copy the actual alliterative bit precisely and not a load of stuff that's round about it. That is, as I say, really important. And that's always a rule for quotes. Quote precisely. Explain carefully why each of your examples from A is an effective use of alliteration. Right, OK, so this is a tricky question. I've left maybe the trickiest till last, but you're all very smart. So this will be no trouble for you, I'm sure. Um, Explain carefully. So explain means that I need to come out of what you say understanding it and not just having more questions to ask. Carefully means a certain level of detail is expected, okay? Obviously. Why each of your examples from A is an effective use of alliteration. What does that word effective mean? Because it doesn't just mean good. It means more than that. It means that it has an effect on the reader. So it makes the reader think or feel something that they might not have thought or felt without the alliteration. OK, so we need to talk about what this makes the reader think or feel. Now, very luckily for us, because we're such a smart group of people, we have already done that when we were discussing the examples. <clears throat> so we said about the first one that it sounds like someone whispering secretly secretively, the friend of the fox fears the fox's enemy. And that reflects the desire of people not to let others know about the foxes. OK, so we've got it. Now, look at the question. There are five marks available here. And we had a lot more to say about this quote than about the second. So if you think about how about that first five marks might break down, we should really be aiming to get three marks for this first explanation. So it should be nice and thorough because we're going to struggle to get three marks of content out of wily creature weaves. It's just not so much to say about that. <clears throat> so um, the F sounds and that's important because I make in fact I'll make it a capital F to make it clear because of, you know, my handwriting. I would if it would let me rub it out. Uh-oh, I think my tablet's getting hot and it's, I'm getting a delayed response. Okay, I might just have to... Uh-oh, right, my tablet has crashed. This is something of a crisis. What can I do here? Aha, uh -huh, it's not completely crashed, it's just... Good, there we are, excellent. That's what I needed to do. The F sounds... So, sorry, what was I saying? Um, You've quoted the bit with alliteration in, but you want to make it absolutely clear to the marker that you know what is alliterating. So it's good to state it. Very, very good to state it. The F sounds are like a secretive whisper. This reflects the fox lovers desire for their knowledge not to be overheard. Okay, if you remember, this is their knowledge of where the foxes are because they don't want people hunting them. Okay, the F sounds are like a secretive whisper. This reflects the fox lovers desire for their knowledge not to be overheard. Got it. So we've clearly explained the first part. I was like a secretive whisper, the what it actually sounds like. And then we're dealing with the what you could call the metaphorical side. So what this kind of implies about what's going on in the background. And I think this is a really full and clear explanation. And frankly, I'd struggle to find much more to say about this. Would I? Let's just check my example answer um, from 11 plus lifeline just to check that there isn't something else important to say. Um, um, Oh, yeah. I, I, what I said in my example now, so I'll read it out to you because there's a little bit more in it, more in it, although I think this is fine. So I said in my example, 
The alliterated F sounds are like whispering or very quiet, quiet movement over the leafy floor of a wood. Okay, so there's that second part there. It emphasizes the secrecy of the friend of the fox who doesn't want to reveal the animal's location. So there's the extra point there about quiet movement over the leafy floor of the wood. Maybe I could have included that. I think what I've got here should be fine, though. Okay, second part. Um, let's make sure I don't miss anything from my notes this time. Yeah. Um, so here, there's not so much to say about the sound itself. Um, the repeated W is like the fox's repeated weaving. Now I've used a little bit of license here putting weaving in quotation marks because the actual word in the text is weaves, but I think I can get away with this um, to make it fit into the grammar of my sentence. The repeated W is like the fox's repeated weaving um, as it goes back and forth to disguise its direction. And so my handwriting for today is done. And here we've got the first part that's really full and looks at two different aspects of the effect of the F sounds. We've got a second part which is clear but simpler and should reliably get two marks. Overall, this really ought to be a five mark answer. Good. Splendid. Uh, we've already been going for 45 minutes, so I'm not going to go on too much longer here. Um, I'm just going to very quickly give you my... my tip of the week. Um, and I'm just going to repeat something that I've already said because I think it's fundamentally so important. Always read the comprehension text before you look at the questions. Now I know that some teachers and tutors advise differently. They say look at the text with each question that you answer. In my very strongly held opinion this is bad advice. What happens then is that people, for example, get into fundamental mix-ups about which character is doing what in, doing what in, doing what in the text. Um, people look for evidence in the text to answer a question and they find it and they simply don't know that there's more evidence to answer the question in a later paragraph that they haven't seen yet and so they write an incomplete answer and so on and so forth. You can't reliably do comprehension, whether it's written comprehension or multiple choice, if you look at each part of the text as you answer the questions. You'll also waste a lot of time because with every question, you'll be fishing through the whole text looking for what you need, which becomes a real waste of effort. Read the text carefully and thoroughly before you go through the questions. When you're practicing on your own time, read it more than once so that you know it really well. That will ingrain good habits. But in the exam, read it at least once, probably before you even look at the questions. It's really, really important what other misguided adults might say. And that is my tip of the week. OK, I'm just very quickly going to look at a few of... And then I will say adieu, um, because as I say, the lesson has been going on plenty long enough. I need to shout out for Malini's big cat, which is the name she has given to the cat she saw outside. Um, Saida says, how should I focus more? Um, that's a massive question. and I don't know you, so it's very hard to answer. But a couple of things that I would say. First of all, you need to have a good structure for your work. And for most people, I don't think that means a detailed revision timetable. What it does mean is a clear list of where your weaknesses are. So that when you're thinking, what I focus on, I'm not sure what the direction of this practice is, you know that there's a list of things that you need to work on that you need to go back into. So it might be particular kinds of questions, it might be particular grammar structures, it might be particular maths topics, but it also might be particular kinds of wording in maths questions. And you should have a good stock of questions um, as you get towards your exams, which you can dig back into. And so you should always have a good list of things that you're weak at for you to explore and pick things out and look at. Also, when you lose focus, it's to do with stuff that's going on in your brain, in your mind, thought processes, patterns of things that distract you, which cause you to lose focus. And part of doing the 11 plus is learning to know yourself better. 
and recognizing what the things are that encourage you to lose focus or drag your focus away, identifying them and working out ways to combat them, ways to deal with them. So there'll be some distractions which you know are too much to overcome. And then you should have good sense to say, right, that thing is distracting me, so I'm going to stop for five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, take a break. And there'll be other distractions that you know how to deal with, either by making yourself stop thinking about the things, putting some noise cancelling headphones on, whatever it might be. So a lot of it is also about learning your own habits and finding good ways to deal with them. Um, do, 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 do. CGP or Bond, which one would you recommend, Robert? Um, uh, naturally, I would recommend RSL Educational Resources, published by somebody whom you may know. Uh, but uh, in, in all seriousness, it really depends on the exam you're doing and different kinds of exams are better addressed by different by different publishers, it's worth having a range of resources from different publishers and choosing wise, wisely based on the skills that you need to practice, both in general for your exams and the style of exam, but also more specifically for the particular skills you need to work on at this point in time. So I would say, you know, lots of publishers have different things to offer. It's about using those resources intelligently and probably don't get too hung up on materials from any one publisher, unless it's me. Okay, um, how to pace yourself in the test, asks Michael E. Gospel. Um, sounds, like, sounds like the name of an American novelist to me. How to pace yourself in the test. Well, um, practice is the main thing. You need to get used to pacing yourself. Uh, and most of that, a lot of that will come from untimed work and getting used to identifying um, what the issues are you need to work on and developing those skills which will enable you to move more quickly in the future. Um, but this is slight, this is another version of, of how do I deal with running out of time in an exam, which is a question I often answer. And um, um, the, um, th the real answer to that is that you need to identify the things that slow you down. And so when you do do time to practice, you need to work out where it is that you're getting stuck. What kinds of questions, what skills are causing you to stare at the paper rather than keep moving on through? Which kinds of answers are you having to repeatedly re-edit so that they actually get the marks? And so on. And you need to identify those skills and work on them. And then when you've worked on them slowly and carefully and you go back into another time piece of work, you'll be able to progress more quickly. Someone asked in a comment that's just disappeared from view, um, what's that banging in the background is your wife cooking, it sounds like pans. And no, it's a building site outside the window, believe it or not. Um, someone asking about percentages. I mean, I've dealt with percentages quite a lot in previous videos and there's a link below to a list of all my videos, um, but you can also go onto YouTube and in the YouTube search box, put easy 11 plus percentages and you'll find my videos there. Yes, it is surely a topic that I will cover again in the future, but there is already quite a lot for it on the channel. Um, Pre says, which order should you start in? For example, should you start with the comprehension, then applied reasoning? Which way do you suggest? I think you're asking about a specific exam. Usually in an exam, it's best to move in the order that the questions are presented in, unless there's a good reason not to, I would say. Um, that way you're less likely to get confused and end up missing things out. Um, right, I'm going to call today there because we're 50 minutes in. Very sorry to anybody who I haven't, um, haven't answered. Um, a big shout out to Ian's cat, Luna. Hello, Luna. Um, one of my um, one of my favourite pop songs is a um, pop song called Luna um, by um, who's it by? By Gianni Tonyi. There we are. A little bit of a little bit of pop music pretentiousness for you. Um, um, shout out to Simon's cat Caramel. Also, what is written comprehension? Uh, written comprehension is a comprehension test where you have to write out your answers in words rather than selecting from a list of options. I apologise if that wasn't clear before. Um, okay, right everybody, fantastic to have you here. Check out the free feedback offer that I may already have mentioned. You can see it linked at the top of the 11 plus lifeline webpage. Go and have a look. All right, splendid to see you here. Oh, but somebody, somebody has come to say goodbye. I bet that wasn't intended, but he's here now, so he can't escape. It's a big goodbye from me and from Grigri, -Gri, and I very much look forward to seeing you for the next Easy 11 plus live lesson. Goodbye. All right, Grigi, should we say goodbye? He's not impressed. <laughs>